Hey, we're Ginger and Jeremy Volo, and this is the Hope We Hold podcast. Where we have weekly conversations around our family table to share the hope of Jesus. If you guys have appreciated this podcast so far, we'd appreciate it if you rate and review the podcast. Um, Also, if you have any questions, please send them in. Uh, We love hearing what you guys have to say. And... um, just contact, you can send it into contact at hopewehold.com. Yeah, it's been uh, good getting your messages. We enjoy reading them. And actually, they've given us some great ideas for future episodes, right. which uh, we love because we want to hear what you guys are thinking about and interact on that. So, yeah, like Ginger said, send them in. So, 2020 has been a wild ride, hasn't it? It has. Yeah, I don't think any of us predicted what could have happened, um, what has happened, transpired in this year. Um, And we're only halfway through the year, uh, but there's always something to smile about, even in the storms, and we're always smiling from your messages. So I want to take a second, and we are going to read a few of these. So from one of our listeners, um, this is what they said. I just want you to know that I have just begun to rediscover my faith again, and I have enjoyed your first two podcasts. Thanks for, to both of you for making these talks so enjoyable and easy to listen to and follow along with. Yeah, that's amazing. Honestly, um, nothing encourages us more than to hear messages like that, uh, that your faith is being rekindled or that you've been able to reconnect with the Lord. And really for Ginger and us to be a part of that is pretty humbling. Yeah, it's so humbling and humbling and helpful. Um, it's just such an encouragement um, to hear from you all. Yeah, listen, listen to this message from Linda. Uh, she wrote, My husband of 35 years passed away almost 15 months ago. I enjoy your podcast. You two remind me of us when we were younger. I look at his passing this way. God didn't take my husband home to unhinge my life. He took him because he loved Michael that much to relieve his pain and usher him home. I miss him so much, but we don't mourn as those with no hope. I will see him again in the twinkling of an eye. Wow, that's pretty incredible. Um, And that's real life, isn't it? Um, I know a podcast like this is only a small part, uh, but the truths that God gives us in the Bible really do transform everything. Mm. Um, To hear from Linda how it's been so transformative for her, um, the truths of God's Word, they, they can even transform 2020, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, a year of pandemics, um, murder hornets, uh, political tensions, a year of Twitter. Uh, but even 2020, uh, God's truth can handle that. Yeah, that's right. And that last comment on Linda losing her husband, I can't imagine the pain that she's experienced. Mm-hmm. Um, we've only been married for just three and a half years, but it really feels like forever, and I can't imagine life without you, babe. And so I just think about Linda, and who had her cow for 35 years, and then she lost him, and just the pain is so unimaginable. And yet I think it's remarkable to read her words. Um, I miss him so much, but we don't mourn as those with no hope. Yeah, she's she's citing a passage from the Apostle Paul uh, that he wrote to the Thessalonians, and it's uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 where he says, uh, we don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep or those who've died, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. And then Paul Mm -hmm. says this, which is really remarkable. He says, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And that is very encouraging. The reality that Mm -hmm. death for the Christian is not the end. Uh, for those who are trusting in the person and promises of Jesus, we can go, we can really go through anything and have hope. And I mean everything. Yeah, that's so true. And that's what we want to discuss today. Hope in the most hopeless situations. And we've actually asked our dear friends, Isaias and Danielle Munoz, to join us on this episode. Uh, Isai is a fellow Master Seminary student with me, or actually he was, he's graduated now. Congrats on that, by the way. Thanks, man. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really been for us a joy getting, getting to know both of you. Likewise, yeah, we love you guys. Thank you for having us uh, yeah, on the Yeah, thank you. Today. Yeah, well, we're excited because um, we've asked Isaias and Danielle to come on and share their story. 
Um, and it's really an incredible story that you guys have to share. Yeah, um, I think the more you live, the better the story. So uh, sometimes it comes with its ups and downs, but we're thankful for how God has led us on this journey. So we're, we're grateful to be here and to share it with you. Yeah, and we want to get into that journey in a minute. Um, but Isai, you said something to me the other day in a conversation that when you said it, I immediately wrote it down. Uh, and it was this. You said, there's something that you learn in the trial that you can't learn without it. Mm -hmm. uh, wow, that's pretty powerful. Talk about that for a second. What does that mean? There's something you learn in the trial that you can't learn without it. Yeah, I mean, so for me, and I'm not going deep into my story yet, but growing up in the church, being a, a pastor's kid, coming to seminary, um, something that can happen is that theology is super black and white to you. And so you're constantly reading scripture, you're constantly feeding off the word of God and hearing it being taught. Um, but until it becomes application, it really hasn't taken flight in your life. Yeah. And so the way that I, I really put it for people oftentimes is um, when you're reading scripture, you really are reading black and white, but until it unfolds in your life, yeah. it doesn't take on that color. Um, that really makes theology pop and have that beauty and it makes it vivid. And so um, sometimes you just need to go through something to really understand what it means that God is faithful. Um, yeah, I know our listeners can relate to that as the four of us here talking can, that you know, it's one thing to read truth, to read the Bible, to read the promises of God, right? Mm -hmm. And reading those promises, they're beautiful. Um, the Word of God is powerful. But something takes shape when they, they become more than words, and mm -hmm. it, it, it becomes the, the only thing you're holding on to for life and for hope. Yeah. When ev you feel like everything else has been stripped away, and all you have are those promises. Yeah. Um, and it really creates like a living vitality in, in, in those realities. Um, okay, Absolutely. so we want to get into that. Yeah, so let's start at the beginning. Um, in just a few minutes, can you guys uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves and your journey so far? How did you meet? How did you end up in LA? And what has God been uh, doing in your life since you've been here? Sure. Um, well, I was born here in California, only a few hours north of L.A. in Visalia, California, and Isaias grew up in New Jersey, so we were on different coats, uh, coasts. East Coast. <laughs> East Coast. East Coast, East Coast. West Coast, Best Coast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we actually met in college at Cornell, so we both went there. Ivy League. I like that. Yeah, and we met only Orientation Week. Only some believe it. We met during orientation week um, briefly, and then I was really delighted to see him at a Christian fellowship um, a few weeks later, um, and that's where we really got to know each other, was serving in ministry on campus, talking about Christ with other students and peers at our university. Um, it wasn't quite love at first sight. <laughs> he was kind of the class clown of our friend group. <laughs> I wear that as a badge of What's honor. changed? <laughs> uh, I met the right person. <laughs> <laughs> he did mellow out a little bit, and I matured too. And by our senior year, we were engaged, and then we got married soon after graduating. Yeah. And did you guys date all four years? Started. Mm, well, it's a, it's a, you know, we don't have time to go into that story. It was a long <laughs> journey. Love at first sight for me was true. It just took a oh. long time to, to finally make it happen. Um, no, we dated. I think it was sophomore years so when we started sophomore year dating. We started so. Been together ever since, yeah. Yep, and um, and then right after graduating, a door opened up for you to serve as a youth pastor, actually, in my hometown church, like where I became a believer in high school, a believer in the gospel, and so that was pretty neat. We moved back there, got married, you were serving in ministry, and then I was also um, teaching, coaching volleyball, and I started a blog, so it was a... Fun and what is your year. blog? Because if, if our listeners want to go and check out more about you guys, they'll hear your story. What, can you, how did they get connected with your blog? Yeah, um, well, it's called livingfreeindeed.com, uh, and it's just for Christian women. I just love writing about what it looks like to apply theology as a woman of God and what that looks like in practical sense as a mom, as a wife, 
um, in school and yeah, just like to share encouraging scriptures and thoughts. And it's the same mm-hmm. Instagram, Facebook, Living Free Indeed. Yep, Living Free Indeed. And it's based on John eight thirty six. Um, so if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And so it's a lot about the freedom we find in Christ. Um, but yeah, that was a neat part of our newlywed life, starting that up. Yeah. And then, oh, well, then you got to go to seminary. Yeah. Yeah, doors opened up to, it was really funny how it happened, actually. My aunt saw this advertisement for the Master Seminary on Twitter and just sent it to me and was like, hey, you should think about it, you should go. And um, again, growing up in church and my dad being a pastor, I was, I feel like I was set up for ministry if I didn't know it, but um, in ministry, I realized, okay, I need to go to seminary. I need to actually be trained for this. And so the doors opened up for that and uh, Danny felt that it was the right opportunity for us, and so yeah, it was really exciting, and I'm glad that it was going to work out for our family. So yeah, we moved to LA. Oh, actually, well, yeah, rewind. For a bit, we we it were wasn't also quite that pregnant. Easy. We got pregnant with our firstborn, our daughter, um, like in our first year of marriage, mm-hmm. and so we, we couldn't quite move to LA right away, and she yeah. was born the first week of classes mm-hmm. for you, but you were also commuting from Visalia, which if you're not, California, it's like three hours away from LA. So he was commuting twice a week, yeah. um, Did that three for the hours first both ways. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was fun times, but it was really neat because I was either really stoked about getting to class or about getting home to see baby girl um, and my wife. So it was, it was fun for a little bit, and then that wore off, and we finally moved to L.A. in 2017, um, and things were pretty smooth at that point. Doors opened up to be here. We're really glad. I started working here at the church and at the seminary, um, and Danny was staying at home with our our little one, Emariah, and doing her blog thing, and yeah, we were, we were cruising along. So we can relate uh, having a little girl as our first child. Yes. A uh, little Felicity, a um, little bit behind you guys. Um, but I think with that comes along one of the hardest reality, realities that, that we could imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when we think about what trials could affect Felicity, our daughter. Um, how would we respond if she were to be hurt? Um, and, you know, Ginger and I were talking the other day about I think it's natural for us to have the mindset that, you know, it's easy for us to accept things happening to us, uh, but when it when difficult things happen to those you you love and care about the most, um, that can be really challenging. And I know a lot of our listeners have gone through and are living through the situations where um, it's the it's the people they love the most who who've been hurt and um, are going through difficulty. And so um, we want you to, to tell your story um, because the, the, the story of God's grace through trial and having hope in what seems to be some of the most hopeless situations really begins with Amariah, doesn't it? Yeah, for us in a, in a, big, pay, in a big way it does. Um, you know, obviously there are things that were going on in our life that were not easy, I guess, before MRI situation, but it was at that point where we dealt with some things with our daughter that things definitely turned. So um, as I mentioned, when we moved to L.A., uh, things were going really well. And so we had just started settling in a bit. I mean, I was feeling at home here at the seminary. We were finally making friends at the church. Um, And like you mentioned with us, MRI being our oldest and our only daughter at the time, there was something really neat and uh, sweet about that, and we were just enjoying being parents. Um, and while we were here, we also were we got pregnant again with our our baby boy Ezra, uh, who's a joy for us. And um, he was born December third of twenty eighteen, and um, things were really sweet. And two weeks later, our daughter was kind of falling apart on us. So she had been having symptoms of some illness for some time, and um, we'd noticed it, but we thought maybe it'd go away. Uh, December 19th, um, certain days you don't forget, 
December 19th, um, my wife gave me a call and just said, Danny gave me a call and said that uh, I just needed to get MRI looked at. You know, we'd been waiting a couple of days, as you do with kids. Sometimes they've got fever, they've got this and that and the other. You're just kind of waiting it out. But she said, no, we should take her in. It's not going away. Um, it was our last day of work here before Christmas break. Um, so we were, it was odd. I was really excited about, just had our baby boy. We were going into Christmas. Um, it was going to be a sweet time. And I just thought this was a little bump in the road. We'd take her in, get some meds, go home. Took her to urgent care, and um, the doctor gave her a look up and down and immediately told me she couldn't help us um, and just said, uh, you're going to need to go to a hospital as, as soon as possible, like right now. So thankfully, she referred me to a children's hospital in L.A., um, and I just, my mind thought, that's where I need to get. I didn't, you know, she said, get to the closest one, but if you can get there, get there. And I just thought, whatever it is, let me get there. So, well. We went, it was about 3 p.m. in the afternoon, um, and we were there for six hours, which was, you know, with every minute going by, you're like, okay, something's not right, but what is it? Um, and around 9 p.m., the doctor came in, and, and it was her and a nurse, and she just looked at me and said, can I, can I speak with you in another room? Um, and for me, that's where it started, started caving in a little bit. I could just tell this wasn't, you know, why, why don't, why not just tell me here? Um, so, you know, we go to another room and, and her and a social worker are there and, and she just breaks the news that my, our daughter had uh, cancer, uh, leukemia. And, um, you know, she spoke for probably 15, 20 minutes. And I, the only word I remembered was cancer. <laughs> that was about the only thing I got. Um, I was just kind of stuck on that. I've never dealt with that in my family. Um, I, you know, by God's grace, my family has been pretty healthy and spared from that. And I know a lot of friends that had, but I, I'd never dealt with it personally. Danny, I know has had some, um, some of those situations come up in her family in the past, but older relatives. Yeah. yeah. When it's your daughter, it, it's, it hits a little different. So, um, I was just numb and, um, yeah, I, it was interesting. I, you know, emotionally, I really didn't know how to respond. I was kind of just thrown off. I just knew, like, the one thing going through my mind was, like, how do I call my wife, who's at home with a two-week-old, who's been getting ready for just the sweetness of the holiday season and enjoying this family time, and tell her, hey, instead, you know, MRI has got cancer, and we've need to, we need to figure this out now. We need to work through this. Um, but, uh, man, God's faithfulness starts way before that but in that when i made that call i think i saw um, a glimmer of it even in our conversation together uh, my wife held me down that night in terms of um, just helping me ground myself in christ and uh, her resolve over the phone really helped me and and uh, you know kept my mind and my focus in the right place and um, we talked we cried we did the whole thing um and uh, we got right to it. So MRI has been going through some chemotherapy ever since. Um, she's slated to finish April 2021, which is... Yeah, we just heard today. We just heard that today, and that's pretty Recording exciting. This. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. that's yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Yes. How long um, and how old was she at that point when you first heard? She had just turned two. Yeah. And so she'll be four, almost five when she finishes. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did that conversation sound like? What did she tell you? Or, and how did you respond, Danny, when you first got the call? I actually had some suspicion that she had leukemia a few days. Um, it was, and it was really odd. I totally attribute, to, attribute it to God um, because I had not, even though I had cancer in my family, um, no one ever had leukemia. But I just, that thought just kept passing through my mind. And so that's why I called them so urgently that day I'm like we just need to get her checked like this is not normal even though it, it was just surface symptoms of like a fever and some um pale skin but I just had a you notice a couple yeah. other things too right like just random bruising and things yeah. that weren't going right so there was to a degree that I was not surprised but of course it was devastating and um but yeah it's amazing right like he says God's faithfulness his spirit was right at work just bringing to my mind that, okay, God, 
he knows and we can trust him. And that's pretty much what I said. I'm like, okay, this is, this is hard, but we can trust him. Yeah, I, that's what shocked me. Like I expected to, and I expected to call my wife and, and maybe for her to be more devastated than, than what kind of happened. I mean, we did cry and it was hard, but to hear her on the other side of the phone to just tell me like, you know, this is what God has for us and we can get through this. Um, I think for me was a great reminder of just the wife that I have and the partner that by God's grace I chose and that I'm grateful to be with. So um, in that moment, even though everything was super chaotic around us, I was even then grateful because I knew I had the best partner available to get through it with. So yeah. And the hardest yeah. thing was that we weren't together um, yeah, because sure. we just had little Ezra. Yeah. Cause I had, to we couldn't be in the ER and together and I wasn't able to see MRI for mm -hmm. actually a few days. We stayed at the hospital yeah. until Christmas Eve. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then we, we went home Christmas Eve and actually spent Christmas day at, at home together. How was that? What was that like? It was interesting. Uh, the grandparents came in. Yeah, a lot of family both came. Both your, your parents and my parents. And so... In this tiny little apartment. <laughs> I mean, they helped us yeah. so much. Um, from family members cleaning up the place and just making sure it was ready for us when we got back to my parents flying out from New Jersey and being here and supporting us and just making sure we were taken care of. Um, it was odd. Yeah, it's not MRI how you, you wasn't know, quite herself. <laughs> it's funny, you're always like, what do we want to do for Christmas? Um, and in that moment, all of us, I think, were thinking, not this, but it's what we had, and we, we think we're also just trying to make the most of it. And um, Well, also, I don't know, we too, just, like... You know, what amazing part of it was that you would think, oh, wow, this is Christmas. This is supposed to be a happy, joyous time where you're carefree and you're with your family. Um, and so like to say, like when we tell people like, yeah, our daughter got diagnosed around Christmas, like there's like, oh, man. But it's also m wonderful to think about that. Like that's when we're rejoicing in Christ that he came mm -hmm. and that he has brought redemption. He has come to bring light to the darkness and being able to reflect on that in the midst of of that situation, it was like, wow, like that's the most, it wasn't the most beautiful Christmas, but it was the most impactful because you're like, this is the gospel. It's giving us hope right now, yeah, no matter what happens to MRI. Yeah, that's the think that ever got for us, right? Like usually mm -hmm. you definitely are, even as an adult to some extent, you're kind of like, oh, well, let's do the gifts thing. Let's do the food thing. Let's just hang out. Let's watch some Christmas basketball, if you're me. Um, but that was definitely different. Like we, it's crazy, but we had no appetite for most of those things. Our our entire, um, our home was just kind of like, what's happening, but also what a time to treasure Jesus together. Mm -hmm. um, just hold on together in, in something that is going to become quite a journey now. Um, and so it was a really sweet time to rally around the beauty of the gospel and that God saves and he sustains. And so... Uh, an interesting season and I mean it affects all your Christmases going forward to some extent last yeah you know now now you have that fresh in your mind <laughs> but um but still good so you began chemotherapy for Mariah yeah and what did life look like from that point on oh man um the first year of chemotherapy was was the roughest um so the we first started month again, was December the... 2018 and that first month was the roughest Crazy. of the rough. I think we were in the <laughs> hospital almost every day for in that January. first 30 days. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just funny. I mean, at this point, your mind is all on leukemia, but there's other things that can happen. So MRI, even during that time, contracted a lung infection that complicated things. And it was just like, what's going on? Well, because you get in immunocompromised due to the yeah. treatment. So you can pick up anything. Yeah. Something so, that we would just easily filter out of our lungs caused a major infection and yeah. um so th those secondary uh infections are actually like one of the more dangerous things than the actual cancer itself um for many people and or I mean, for many she's kids. just getting used to a new world too mm -hmm. um you know i stayed at the hospital so many nights that first month and from blood pressure to you know getting poked with a needle to um just constant constant doctors coming in and out and and poking and prodding or whatever they need to do and this is all new for her just like it is for us and that was the hardest thing for me was how do i 
console my child even as we're trying to help her. And she doesn't understand yeah. because she was only two. So. Felicity's, Felicity's two. Yeah. And I'm just thinking right now, how would you even approach that with her mm -hmm. to the point that she'd have any understanding of it? Yeah. Um, you know, with a two-year-old, it wasn't, it's almost like you're just trying to get her to understand this is just what we do. You're trying not to take it any deeper because that's all you have. That's all she has to some extent. So it was like, okay, you, well, we need to do this. We need to do this and it's okay. I'm here and, and God is with us and God cares about us. He's going to help us. And that took some time, but you know, it is pretty sweet. And I think of it as um, God's goodness to us, but Mariah picked up on it pretty well. Um, like she, she started doing really well with all the stuff to the point that she, she became a, they, they called her like a resident nurse. She was helping all the time and, um, she would pump her own chemo into her, uh, pick line or port and help out and, and the do the pressure blood pressure thing on. for herself and check the stethoscope and do all that stuff. And, um, but she just, I think in a lot of ways, it just, it helped her. You know, and, and God helped me with that, but to help her it was to be firm that this is what we need to do and I'm here and I'm and I'm gonna be with you. Um, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that this is what we gotta do. I'm here and I'm with you. So um that resolve to be strong for her I think really helped her. And that's all yeah. you can do at that and age. Not even just um not even just well, I guess I was gonna say that um that it's hard as a parent, right, to watch that. But um, part of that was, you know, like you said, just being strong and firm, not acting like it's okay, because we know it's not easy. But at the same time, not showing our own, if we have any anxiety in us, like we knew that it wasn't going to help her to show that or to, and I think even the nurses, like, it's all glory to God, because the nurses would even tell us, like, when we come into your room, like, we it's peaceful and we know you're just trying to encourage her and you're just trying to do one step at a time instead of like you being full of fear and anxiety and your child feeding off of that because it's really hard as a parent to to see that and so I can see why so many parents struggle with that and we did of course in the beginning but we quickly discovered that if we yeah. resolve ourselves to be strong then it helps her mm -hmm. to see that it's going to be okay. Yeah, Even and exuding if it's that for, strength doesn't doesn't yeah. mean that you're um, that you ignorant are. of what's going on. Yeah, right? like mm -hmm. like exuding that strength means I can hug you and tell you that we still need to do this at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like I can I can kiss your forehead a million times and say I love you, and we still need to do this um, because I love you. We need to get through this, and that's that's what it was, and that's what yeah, it is. Yeah. It eventually, is that yeah, eventually we memorized Joshua one nine. Yeah, be strong and courageous. <laughs> Um, do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go and she memorized that we actually have it hanging in our home um, but maybe that helped me more than her because she didn't really know the full meaning of all those words but but yeah it was one thing that I would recite when I when it was my turn to have to help her with the procedure to recite that to her and remind her we can be strong and courageous and not just on our own strength but because God is with us yeah that's beautiful for sure um Another question for you guys, like in the midst of these dark times, I mean, were there also some beautiful moments that you saw? Man. So many. <laughs> I know. The question, the question catches you off guard because you're trying to process which one. Um, you know, for me, some of the most beautiful moments as uh, someone who was there in the hospital a lot and you know, and it's just the necessity that we had. Danny had to be home a lot with our, our little guy who wasn't going to make it all day at a hospital. Um, being at the hospital with her, um, my freshest memories are of uh, waking up in the mornings and her asking me to play worship music or wanting to uh, listen to some of her favorite songs and just singing and us singing together in the room and, um, you know, just coming down to her level and to her place of joy. Um, she still had a lot of joy even in this whole thing. And so thinking about how much, even in spite of how difficult this has been, um, I mean, she smiles and she laughs and she has fun. And I, and I just, 
think about how gracious God has been to her and to our family um, that we've been able to enjoy a, a joyful kid and and she's handled it in the way she has and it's not the same that's not the same for everyone and we recognize that um, and I and I'm sensitive to that I do know that some kids struggle more than others and but I'm grateful for the for the smiles I'm grateful for the happy mornings and the dancing and the um, reading books. I mean, that's her favorite thing to do. And just those moments in the hospital where her and I could bond together. Um, and where, I mean, she's, she's just the best. I mean, I just, I love seeing her <laughs> interact with people and, and make their day and make them smile. And so those things were really sweet to me. Um, and you know, there's, heart. there's a, uh, a, a childish kind of naivete yeah. uh, that kids have, like they don't understand the weight of the world. Yeah. Did you ever find, you know, as you were beat down by the reality of what was going on, that sometimes her just kind of naive joy, was that ever contagious for you? Oh, yeah, for absolutely. Sure. Mm-hmm. And I think for, I mean, for anyone that knows MRI, it's almost been that way. Like, you know, maybe we'll talk more about that, but we tend to get folks that come up and they expect the worst from us emotionally or mentally, but they take a look at MRI and it's like, oh, wait, she's, she looks she's, like she's doing okay. pretty good. <laughs> and um, I remember saying that to people a lot when, as we were going through this, is like, um, aside from the fact that she's lost her hair, you know, you really wouldn't tell most of the times that something was going on there. She, mm-hmm. And it is, it's just a naivete that, that's there and, and, and a sense of not really understanding the full situation. And, um, you know, there's something about that that helps a parent as well. And so we we cling on to that to just make the most of every moment we have, um, extract all of that joy and just try to make it useful so that us as a family could um, bond better and enjoy time together. So um, that's that's been really sweet. And I mean, I don't think anything gets sweeter, right, than watching MRI and Ezra love each other throughout this whole process. So. Yeah, I think they're going to have a special bond because <laughs> when we kind of laugh, um, not laugh, I don't know if that's the right word, but, uh, you know, right now with the coronavirus, a lot of us have had to stay at home for the past few months. Um, but for Ezra, you know, this happened right when he was born, and she was immunocompromised for most of that first year of treatment, so he couldn't go out pretty much that first year, and so it was really just the four of us a lot of the time. I mean, we did get visits from family, but it led to just so much family bonding and those two getting really close yeah, and really enjoying well. each other's mm-hmm. company and her loving on her brother and even serving her little brother, her baby brother, not even realizing that she was the one who needed a lot of serving at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was like, I was going to say, like, you experienced a lot of those moments in the hospital, but when she was out of the hospital, she was home with me and it was the same thing of like snuggling on the couch and reading books and just seeing her mind still develop and and learn more about God and learn more about the world even though she wasn't physically there her mind was still bright and the Lord was still at work so yeah so how's MRI today MRI is doing really well um we actually just got out of a, an appointment today and she had a checkup and uh some chemo that they did we're at in our last phase of treatment, which is the longest of um, the five phases, and um, but it's a lot less strenuous. So we go once a month at this point, which the first year was way more for uh, our liking. Um, but she's doing really well. Prognosis is good. Um, we're so thankful for her doctors and uh, all the people that have cared for her there at uh, CHLA. And... Um, yeah, we've, she, we're just grateful. I mean, like I said, I think already, but she's slated to be done next April. And um, we're just hoping to get to that finish line, even though we know it's some, somewhat of a road ahead. After that, they got to do like uh, annual checkups for about 10 years or something like that. So we'll get there when we get there. But today she's doing really well. She's been responding to treatment really well. She went into remission um, a month into this thing because of how much yeah. chemo they were. Uh, well, that's the kind of... Dealing. That's how they do it. Yeah, leukemia, that kind of treatment. The goal is one month in to go into yeah, remission. Yeah, it's like a full reset of your blood system. So basically they... Um, man, they like they clean out... Um, all your cells, pretty yeah, much. All, mm. all your blood cells, and then wait for it to rejuvenate and 
Um, she responded well to all that. <laughs> and we've been trying to maintain that ever since. So she's doing good. Wow, that's so encouraging to hear. So as you guys look back on all of this, um, it's such an incredible story. Um, what have you learned? I mean, I know you guys have learned a lot through this, but is there anything that sticks, um, that has stuck in your hearts and minds that you would like to share with all of us? Yeah, I mean, um, funny enough, I, we talked about the first phone call when he broke the news and how I immediately was like, hey, we can trust the Lord. But after hanging up, um, that's when the waterworks really came. And, um, and it was also just really, I don't know, yeah, it's eerie or it's just odd to be by myself with our little newborn son. And kind of, it just like felt like the loneliest night. But at the same time, I couldn't sleep. And um, I just played the Psalms just all night. Um, and the reason why I mentioned that is because I know you guys actually talked about it in a previous episode about worry, about God's sovereignty, and that He's in control, and He is over all things, even the hard things. Um, and that is something, you know, ever since becoming a Christian, I'd heard, you know, God is sovereign, God is sovereign. And I knew it, and I believed it, but then this is, you know, like you said, like you only can really live it when the rubber hits the road, and that night I had to wrestle with that, like, like not so much if God is sovereign, but I actually was struggling with, like, did I do anything to cause this? Mm-hmm. Like, was it something I, like, exposed her to, or... Maybe the things I fed her, like all those mommy fears, <laughs> just kind of bubbled up if I had any role in it. Um, and I still like had those questions a few weeks, you know, the first few weeks. But that night, just listening to the Psalms um, and just hearing, especially um, David, his laments, um, I knew that I could just cry out to the Lord. And, and I just knew that it was going to be for his glory. And... <laughs> And so whether or not I had a role, which I like came to terms like, yeah, God's fully sovereign. So no matter what, I, it's not something for me to dwell on. What I can dwell on, though, is that he did purpose it. And, um, and I can lament. I can cry out to him. I can even express those fears and worries and questions. And I know that he hears it in all my tears. He collects them in a bottle, as the psalm says. And... And then after crying out to him, you know, David finishes with pronouncing who God is, his character, that he is faithful, that his steadfast love endures forever, um, that he is king of kings. Um, And so all those proclamations, hearing that, I was like, okay, like, this is not about me. It's not about me trusting in what I've done or haven't done. It's about me trusting in who God is. And it's amazing mm-hmm. that you you go right to the Psalms because they're so real, they're so mm-hmm. raw. Yeah, it's this uh, almost you know so many of the Psalms begin with this just flood of emotion mm-hmm. in times of trial, and the psalmist is just crying out to God, confused, angry, upset, worried, mm-hmm. and then you see this resolve as the psalmist is wrestling with their circumstances and with the truth, and then. Every psalm ends with this beautiful resolve Mm -hmm. and confidence. Um, So it's it's amazing to hear you say that because that's the psalms, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and it's really interesting. I mean, again, as a seminary student um, where you're bound up in theology, if I was being honest, that wasn't my, my battle. Like, I didn't wrestle with that as much, and that's something that I had to learn. Um, where Danny was struggling a lot with the bouts of, like, how did I bring this about, or did I? Um, I never thought that. And she was struggling with sovereignty in ways that I never have, and I needed to recognize that that's okay. I really needed to recognize that if she's struggling with that, then I need to support her as a husband, and I need to be with her, and I need to love her, and um, I need to cherish the woman that I have and really continue to um, pour the word of God into her heart and and not only by uh, expressing theological truth but by comforting her and um, being with her and coming to her level and 
Um, I'm just wired to think a little bit differently. That's something you said the other day. You said the way I respond to God's sovereignty isn't the way my wife necessarily should. Yeah. And you said I shouldn't expect that from her. Yeah. Um, when she has a tough day with this stuff, it doesn't mean she doesn't believe God isn't good or in control, but she's human, you yeah. said. And Absolutely. a lesson for you as the husband is, is growing in that sensitivity. Growing in that sensitivity and honestly reminding myself that in the midst of a season where you're so focused on your kid, God commands you to focus on your wife. And so I really had to come to a place of, and it's not diminishing my love in any way for my daughter because you, you, you just need to take one look at me and Amariah and you'll see the bond that we have. But I'm one flesh with one person and that's my wife. Um, my kids will one day go on and live their lives and I get to enjoy my wife until the Lord calls us home. And my job is to sacrifice myself for her as Christ has done for the church. Um, and leukemia doesn't change that. Leukemia might change some dynamics in our family. Um, it might be a, a strange road to walk down and a, a difficult one at that. My objective is still to love my wife and to be her greatest ally and to be her best friend, to hear her heart, um, to cry when she cries, uh, to mourn when she mourns, to rejoice when she rejoices. And so I really had to come around to that. Like, I'm not battling with sovereignty in this way. So what? My wife is. And so I need to, I need to step into her lane. I need to comfort her. I need to help her think through that in a loving way. Um, I think we, even for myself, again, you, you tend to pit grace and truth against each other. And they're not enemies, they're friends. So how do I come alongside and help her believe in this truth in a graceful way? So I, I was really learning to love my wife in this season, and I think that's been one of the best things for me. And I'm, yeah, I love you, babe. <laughs> love you too. Yeah, yeah that's, that's powerful. Um, thanks for sharing those guys. Isai, you know, you're the theology guy. Mm -hmm. Like me, uh, you're a seminary grad. You're hoping to pursue your doctorate. Um, so let's talk for a minute about the theology of suffering. Um, what have you learned? You know, uh, we've, we've said it a couple times, but the illustration comes to my mind of um, not just being able to tell someone what to do when, you know, they suffer. You can talk a, about it all day long, that there's a net at the bottom of the building, and if you jump off the top story, that net will catch you. Um, but actually jumping off the building and falling into the net, it's something you have to experience for yourself and mm -hmm. can only genuinely really understand once you've done it, once you've been there. And so... You and I, we're studying theology, we're giving our lives to study theology, to preach theology. Um, but as you've walked through suffering, um, because, you know, it's more than just the leukemia touching Amariah. It put your entire lives on a halt. Mm -hmm. I mean, Christmas plans changed. Everything, I mean, your seminary got prolonged because of this. I mean, the professors had to, I mean, your whole life changed. Mm -hmm. And so in, in a moment, um, so let's think about this just briefly theologically, because we know that the theology is what uh, allows us to, to respond, right? Um, our emotions respond to truth. Yeah. And here the two of you are, you're 27 years old, a young couple in your mid-20s, mid dealing with trials that people in their 60s, 70s, uh, older, younger, couldn't imagine going through. And you're responding the way you are, with hope, with a level-headedness, with a peace, with a joy amidst the storm, though days are tough. Um, let's talk theology of suffering. Yeah. Um, you know, I mentioned this to you before, too, but I, I would start by saying that suffering is a good place to be, right? Um, when you're in a place where, as we've mentioned, you have nothing else to hold on to, there needs to be that constant. And so for us, that's God, that's his word, that's his promises. Um, we could obviously go back to Job, but I, my mind consistently goes back to Abraham. I keep thinking about how Abraham has promised a son and he's 100 years old. And he's like, where is my son? <laughs> and then he, he looks at his wife, who I'm sure was still beautiful, but is 90 years old. 
and he's like, where are we going to have this son? Um, and Romans 4 and 5 puts it in an interesting way in that uh, Romans 4, 18 says, in hope, he believed against hope. Um, and what it means by that, it goes on to say is that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. So, so when I read that, what I'm understanding is Abraham was in a place where he had to say, God said, and that's enough for me. Yeah. I'm obviously not the solution to this problem. My wife's obviously not the solution to this problem. If I think biologically and I think about experiences, my friends have shown me that at 100 years old, I can't have a son. So all I have to hold on to is that God has promised this. That's so good. And I think that we're afraid to accept that that's all we need. And that's because we're human. Yeah. We, we live in a way and our minds operate in a way that tells us we can make our own path and we can fix this and we can, we can, we can alter the course. And the truth of God is that's not the case. We need him and suffering or trials puts us in a place where we get to say, and we get to really even check our hearts and say, how much do I believe in this? Yeah. How much do I believe in what God has said? And it's, it's ironic enough, and Mariah means that. It means God has spoken. And so every day that we look at that little girl, we're reminded that God has promised. And I'm mindful that what God hasn't promised is that my little girl would make it through this. I need to be mindful of that. That wasn't his promise to me in this situation at all. But his promise to me was, and always is and will be, that he's good. His promise to me is that his promises will be fulfilled. His promise to me is that uh, in his son, I don't have to fear death, and neither does my little one. Um, his promise to me is that he'll comfort me, he'll sustain us, that, and, that, and, and that even as we go through this, it's for the purpose of his glory, and not only that, but so that we would be made into his image. And so those are the things that I need to hold on to. And as I think of a theology of suffering, that's where I turn, is that I, I'm hoping against hope. Esai, that's phenomenal. And there's something you said where he doesn't necessarily promise that she'll make it through this. Mm -hmm. Now talk about that, because often when we approach our, our suffering, 95% of the prayers that we offer up are, Lord, get us out of this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Get us out of this. But he doesn't always promise that he will get us out. I mean, even if you look at Christ himself, if you look at the disciples immediately following them, some of their lives were defined from beginning, when they began with Christ to the end, mm -hmm. suffering. Um, and we're, we're told through many tribulations we'll enter the kingdom. Yeah. So we spend 95% of our time praying, saying, okay, Lord, get us past this. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you were tempted at points to even tell him, right, it'll all be okay or we'll get through this. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so talk about that, where it's not only, the, our prayer needs to be deeper and broader than yeah. just, Lord, take this away. Though, though that is a good prayer and a yeah. legitimate prayer, right? Yeah, yeah, and God could do that. Yeah. And praise God when he does. But the reality is that that's not the basis for which, by which I pray or by which I hold on. And so uh, the reality is, as Christians, I don't think that we grapple much with the ideas of um, life getting uncomfortable mm -hmm. and things going wrong. And that's a shame because then I read passages in James, like James 1.12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. And it's not a question there whether or not I'm going to go through trials. Like, he's, he's not making it an if, he's making it a when. Right. And trials are guaranteed for us because of fallenness, because of uh, the fallen world we live in. And so I, I wish that more Christians would recognize it's not an option. Like, you don't, you don't get to choose a life where you won't suffer or where there won't be trials that come your way. Um, and that's really good for you because God's people have to go through the furnace if they want to be refined. Yeah. If you want to come out as gold, you've got to go through a lot of friction. You've got to go through a lot of 
burning metal. You've got to go through a lot of purification, exactly. Um, and the solution isn't Christ removing me from my situation. It's Christ being with me in my situation. Isn't it a beautiful thing in the New Testament? We can think so much of how we're, we're taught to share in the sufferings of Christ and that Christ shares with us in our sufferings. Thereby, I just find it the sweetest thing to know that when I go through a trial like this, or I'm sure people listening are going through their own kind of thing, Christ isn't withdrawing from you. He's leaning in, and he's just asking you to do the same. Mm. And I think it would be foolish for me while someone's lending out a helping hand for me to recoil. I want to hold fast to that guy. Um, and he holds and fast to you. Exactly. If he, and if he saved us, he'll sustain us. And so, yeah, I, I base my hope and uh, my faith on who Christ is and who he is is love and he loves us and he'll keep us. And uh, that's the basis for what we do. And I think one of the primary realities of the gospel is on display here where um, oftentimes we think of the gospel that we come to Jesus to get something else. Mm -hmm. So in the gospel, Jesus gives us something else, health, wealth, happiness, uh, freedom from all this difficulty, right? Well, yeah, that's true. Ultimately in, in heaven, there's no more pain, no more sorrow. He'll wipe away every tear from our eyes. But even in heaven and even in this life, the goal of the gospel is Christ himself, mm -hmm. where we come to the gospel to get Jesus. Yeah. We come to the gospel because we value him. And so if we have Christ, we have everything we need. So we, do we want him to take us out of the trial? Do, I, I would rather be on smooth seas than in turbulent waters. Mm -hmm. But when I'm in the turbulent waters, I still, Christ is with me in the boat and he's still sovereign over those waters. Yeah and that he's the treasure. Yeah. And what's so beautiful about your story, and as Ginger and I listen, and the reason why, as we talked about this, we wanted you guys to come on the Hope We Hold podcast is because you hold this hope where we can't imagine a trial greater than something happening to our, our little baby girl. And it's exactly what you've walked through. And yet to put on display that in the midst of that trial, Jesus Christ, he is the treasure. He is everything we want. He's everything we need. And that we can still have hope. And we rejoice knowing he's with us in the midst of it. Yeah. So, you know, here we're rejoicing that you just got a checkup today and the light's at the end of the tunnel yeah. as far as leukemia is concerned. Mm -hmm. um, but even if the prognosis was different, your story would be the same. Yeah. Well, you know, I. One of the guys I've leaned into during this time is Charles Spurgeon. And if you haven't read of Charles Spurgeon, you should. Um, one of the ways he puts it is that hope is like a star, uh, not to be seen in the sunshine of prosperity and only to be discovered in the night of adversity. Um, you need times, you don't necessarily, necessarily need our experience, but you need difficult times if you're really wanna, wanna treasure hope for what it's worth. And even as you talked about, Jeremy, like in terms of heaven, uh, there's a coming day where we won't need to hope anymore. But while we're in this life, those dark times, they make Jesus and the glory of the gospel and the beauty of who he is and what he's done shine all the brighter. Yeah. And so we need those times if, if we're to see Christ for who he truly is. Yeah. And in this life, we have such a skewed view of him and we don't see him for that uh, for the full glory of all of his value and his worth, but um, these moments help us in that. Yeah. When we're just leaving and living an easy, comfortable, complacent Christian life, uh, you can't expect Jesus to shine very brightly there, the Jesus that died on a cross, yeah. right? right. Uh, Jesus is the suffering servant. Thereby, there's a lot to learn in Scripture and in this theology of suffering I was talking about. Um, in terms of how much uh, Jesus' condescension really means, and especially in light of how beautiful he is when we suffer. Yeah. That's what makes it so beautiful, right, is that he sympathizes with us, and thereby when we see what we're going through, we get to recognize, well, he 
has done the same for us. He suffered for us. So he gets this. He's with us, and we recognize how glorious and matchless he is. Uh, so we do. We need these moments. We need these times. And um, they just helped us to anchor into who Christ is as a family. And, and we're grateful for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest struggles for me beyond that first month when she was not in the hospital was contentment. And, like, suddenly life was not as I expected, right? Like, for the most part, until this happened, it was kind of what I had planned, um, what I wanted, um, in a sense. And then all of a sudden, my daughter is uh, losing weight and sitting on the couch and not even responding to me talking to her when there's other kids outside. <laughs> Sorry, this is where I get emotional. <laughs> but there's other kids outside. I can hear them screaming and playing, and I'm like, Lord, how can this be? How can she have to endure this? And at the same time, I had my own selfish struggles of like, I can't go out. I haven't been to church in months. And, um, and suddenly I realized how quickly we can become dependent on things that are not Christ and how distracted we can get on just the comforts of this world and really seeing that it's out, like we've been talking about how it's outside our comfort zone that we can grow like Christ because we we see that he was not afraid of suffering, that he he came into it so that we would not have to suffer for eternity. Um, and one uh, quote that I had hanging on my fridge to remind me to be content in Christ because he is my everything was um, by Elizabeth Elliot. Uh, if you don't know her, she was a missionary and... Um, she was a missionary in Ecuador with her husband, Jim Elliott, and he actually died um, trying to evangelize to the people that were there. Um, they killed him, um, and so she has given us so many wise counsels over the years before she passed. Um, but she said, the secret is Christ in me, not me in a different set of circumstances. Mm. Um, and so I was like, and she was kind of, you know, echoing Paul, right? Because he talks about, I know the secret um, to being content, you know, whether mm -hmm. I lack or I'm in abundance, um, I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. And that verse gets quoted so often. Um, usually we're like, oh, I'm about to go play a game so <laughs> I can do that. Like I was an athlete, so I'm like, I can do this, you know, and Christ is, he's strengthening me, but it's, it's way more deeper than that. We can do the impossible. It's or at least do like what we're hoping to do. It's more that when you're in the hardest of moments, it is Christ who holds you up. Um, and uh, yeah, and like like we talked about when all those things that you were relying on are taken away or all those and disappointment comes in, um, you realize that Christ is the treasure. Um, so that was a big thing for me to learn, yeah was contentment in Christ, even though life wasn't looking like I thought it should. Mm -hmm. Wow, guys, thank you so much for being willing to share your journey with us. Um, you're bringing hope to a lot of people, I know, definitely. So thank you. Thank you for sharing the hope that you guys hold in Jesus. Yeah, thank you, guys. Yeah, it's been a joy having you. Um, and guys, like we said at the start, um, send in your thoughts, your stories of hope, um, we want to hear those. You know, there's few things more powerful than seeing the realities of, of the hope of Jesus played out in real life, mm -hmm. like with Esai and Danny. Yeah, um, definitely. It's compelling and it brings hope to others. So send in your stories, guys, at contact at Hope We Hold. Um, we appreciate you guys and we trust you are encouraged. Thanks for sitting with, with us today on the Hope We Hold podcast. And it's our hope that your hope would be in Christ alone. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go.